Erica Cobb, are you ready to come back with me? Do you consider yourself a comeback queen and what is the greatest comeback <laughs> of your life? I have to say that we need more responsible people in the media like you. You represent so many of us. I just want to say thank you. You know, um, the genesis of this podcast was that I went through divorce, bankruptcy, unemployment, like all Ooh. together. Oh, hold yeah. up. <laughs> I know, oh. I'm gonna have a little sip to that too. Ah, oh, bless you, and look at you. There are so many nuggets. I call them comeback gems or, you know, comeback nuggets of wisdom, comeback keys. I had to take care of me before I could be available for anybody else. I could talk to you no, I could do. forever. <laughs> I was drawn to you when I saw you. I wanted to make sure that, you know, I got to you somehow. My word of the week is comeback. Okay because everyone is deserving of the comeback that they're willing to earn. And everyone's comeback is different. I know we have been talking uplifting and motivation, but there is a scandal, child, and I gotta ask you about it. I definitely wanna talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> I got the scoop. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. And the winner for Outstanding Society and Culture Podcast is LeVar Burton Reads. So I lost to LeVar Burton. <laughs> <laughs> May I learn to live closer to your divine heart and be unmoved by the voices of the world. I want to cry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I needed to hear that, and I know that my comeback community needed to hear that. Thanks for joining me on Comeback with Erica Cobb, where everyone's deserving of the comeback they're willing to earn. The wonderful, the wonderful, the talented, the amazing Erica Cobb. Welcome to the comeback, everybody! Oh my goodness, look how beautiful you guys are. I just, Erica asked me to do this. She's like, are you gonna be Nervous doing stand up in front of your friends. Now it's like doing it in the living room. I feel like I know y'all, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Erica's comeback, and I, I didn't really understand until I saw that video. It's easy now. We're in this nice ballroom. Clap it up for that. Everybody set up everything. Everybody looks nice. You guys can clap. This is a live show. This isn't on, this isn't streaming. Uh, Erica it always talks about the comeback, but when you're in the middle of it, you don't realize and you don't know that there's an end to it. And when she was talking, I had this weird thing. I promise I'll get to the jokes in a second. But I remember on Sundays when I would go to LA to audition and I would be flying back to Ohio, I would sleep in my car before my flights. But that wasn't like, I wasn't like, oh, I'm really in it. I was just like, yeah, don't, doesn't everybody sleep in the parking lot of, of the coffee bean in, at LAX? I thought that's how the high rollers did it. And uh, speaking of comebacks, how about a hand for the Nuggets? Come on, what? 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 So dope. It's, it, it's weird, because I'm a Cavs fan. But I, but I live here, Cavs. But I, 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 I get it. But you know what? Uh, you know, I just love the Nuggets. They really 
they really did their thing. I was mad that they put LeBron out. LeBron's my dude. He got the championship in 2016. And I read this really cool stat about LeBron. They said he's waiting for two years because in two years, if everything works out perfectly, him and his son are going to be in the NBA at the same time. And I was like, that's super dope. But then I thought about it for like a second. I was like, hold up. In six and a half years, me and my daughter's student loans are going to overlap. <laughs> You know, and that's a real stat, too. Uh, that's a little alley-oop from Dad. It's, uh, it's weird, because, like, college is so expensive, you know, got parents all over the place. Like, I think we're going to be the first generation of parents that have to talk our kids out of going to college. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, 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 I raised you to be an influencer. All right? Your brother was at Harvard. Now he's a DJ in Thailand. Get on his level. I, can't. I never thought, I never thought it would get to this point, you know, and I like, I look at my kids and they're growing up, and I feel, am I the only parent that feels like I have no advice to give? Like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, my kids see me every day. They know, they've seen my body of work. You know, I can't, and it was hard, especially like during, you know, COVID, because, you know, before that, you can kind of, you know, you only see them two hours in the morning, three at night. <laughs> They don't know what's really going on inside. You know what I'm saying? But during the day, they all saw it. It's like, my, I have no credibility with my kids because I had to have the talk with my kids about like, hey, your dad's got numbers dyslexia and can't help you with your homework. That was a rough one, all right? Because they don't, you know, how can they respect me at that point? You know, my son, I know he just, and rather than being empathetic, he would just like, he would mess with me. You know, he would just be like, hey, dad, can you help me with my algebra? I'd be like, you, you don't say no, but you don't say yes. You just, and you're like, can you help me? You're like, oh. <laughs> and I knew he, he was messing with me because he, you know, all that stuff's on the iPad. And I was like, well, let me see it. And like, he, he knew if I saw it, I would say no. <laughs> so he just showed me a little, like he was selling watches downtown. He's like, can you do that? And I was like, all right, I think that was a two. I know what that is. Bring it. And, <laughs> I did, but then when he showed the whole thing, it, I was in trouble, because then there's letters in there, and then there's that thing with parentheses, like it's being sarcastic, you know? And I looked at my youngest son, who's on the spectrum, I'm like, hey, I saw the movie, get a marker and find a window and solve this! <laughs> Y'all did good with the autism joke, I didn't... Look how progressive we have become. Everybody's got this weird, like, condescension, like, oh, your kid's on the spec. Oh. I'm like, I'm trying to turn my autism up. Yes. Yes. My son is kill. Like, like uh, today's Friday. So let's do a little, let's do a little math. Like, in 48 hours, you know, like, most of us are going to have to go to work on a Monday and ask somebody that they don't really like how their weekend was. <laughs> my son will never do that. Yeah. My son does not engage in anything he's not uniquely and innately interested in. My son will live and die on this planet and he'll never have a fraudulent interaction with another human being. I'm like, can I get on that level? Like, I just like, and you know what? He's not rude, and I think we can all learn from this. He's not rude. If he's not interested in what you're doing, he'll just give you a little shoulder. That, wouldn't you be, wouldn't that be nice on Monday? It's like, hey, I went fishing. He's like, I don't know. I don't know. It's really honest. I really, I respect that. And I was thinking about like, you know, my son, he just lives this life that I really respect. And it made me think, I was like, I think America, especially given a state of our politics, I think we're ready for our first autistic president. Are we ready to? How dope would that be? It would be the best, because we, yeah, it's honesty, because like you can't ever, the, the problem with all our politicians, no matter what side you're on, is they've all lived regular people's lives and they've done regular people's shit, you know? They've done everything. They, they got stuff in the closet, they want money, they can be bribed. You can't bribe my son. He don't want nothing unless maybe you got like some Dragon Ball Z DVDs or something. We might be in trouble. You know what I'm saying? Maybe a whole season. My son, I think he would be such a great president, especially because of the political climate. Everybody's so mad about everything. You go to the bar. I hear people arguing about politics at the bar. You know what I want? I want an autistic president because then we just hear, you know, people arguing about stuff that my son was interested in. Like, because when you look at history, 100 years from now, long after we're gone. 
You think about some kid in America cramming for a history test, trying to remember our presidents. He's like, OK, there's that one president, Obama. He was black. He dealt with the financial crisis. COVID, I think that dude, he dealt with COVID. And uh, let's see, who was the last? And then there was that one president that just made the whole country learn about dinosaurs. <laughs> I would be super down with that. I want to hear people at the bar arguing about how to spell pterodactyl. <laughs> Speaking of comebacks, it's been a crazy year for me. Uh, I got my car stolen, uh, right? After COVID. And you know what? It was OK. Because over COVID, I chilled out. I, I don't drink anymore. I really I don't smoke weed anymore, so I'm just sober, so I just feel things now. It's very unique. Y'all should try it. It's like, OK, that just hurts, and you just got to take that. All right. It's, it's really good, because you, know, you don't know if you're a different person, because coming out of COVID, we're all like, oh, I, did that. I, I worked on myself. I feel like I'm different. But you don't know. People are like, oh, I did a week uh, retreat uh, yoga in Tulum. It's like, yeah, you were in Mexico. It's dope. You don't know until <laughs> some shit goes down. And that's what happened. When I got back from my first road gig, first weekend that they lifted protocols, I went to Chicago, came back, found out my car had been stolen from the airport. Oh. The airport. And, and let me just say this, and I'm not money shaming or anything, but uh, you know, look, I, I parked in a real lot. You know what I'm saying? No shade, that expensive lot where you got to do some math about how many days you're going to be gone. Because hey. I've been, obviously, there have been times in my life where I've had to park in the field. We all. <laughs> There's the field where you got to get on an embarrassing shuttle. It's got bubbles on it like it's got the flu. Daddy threw down some cash, you know what I'm saying? And I'm back, and I'm walking around. And I don't know if it's just like black folks, we just believe in institutions. I've been walking around for a couple hours with my luggage, real sweaty, but I'm still blaming myself. I'm like, it's here. This is the airport. International. So after about two and a half hours, this super country white dude straight out of central casting, Ford F-250, the one with the two tires coming off the side of it, he pulls out, he pulls up on me, swings his door open and goes, hey, partner, you look like you're in some trouble. Get in. And I did. <laughs> Do you understand what kind of peril a black man has to be in to get in that truck? No questions asked. Like, yeah, I just, I'm sure he was on the phone like, yeah, I just got, he just got in. I ain't to use anything. <laughs> And this is why I say every black dude needs a super country, honest, white friend. Because he was the first person to help me break. Because I'm still in my, I'm like, the car's here. It's here. You know what I'm saying? And I got in the car, and he was just so direct. Because his truck, we could see over all the cars. And I go, I'm looking for my car. And he goes, oh, that's gone, buddy. And I was like, <laughs> and I go, well, what should we do? And he goes, call the police. And I was like, that never crossed my mind. <laughs> 45 years old, I have never called the cops. I don't care. I'm like, hey, let me use your phone. Come on. Mm. I didn't get my number. I walked around so long looking for my car that, like, when I did finally go to look for the airport, uh, call the police, they would, I didn't know the police went home. They are just gone, you know? And it goes to a call service and, like, this super pleasant, like, 16, 17-year-old black girl answered the phone. And I know y'all like, how do you know she's 16, 17? I have a 16-year-old black daughter. I know what she's having. And plus, she had that, my mom's not home, but can I take a message energy? <laughs> and you know, she's like, the sergeant is gone for the, day, gone for the night, but he'll call you in the morning. So I was like, word. So and just like she said, 7.30 in the morning, sergeant calls, more honest than the country, dude. I, I'm, I'm still freaked out. My car is gone. I had to take an Uber home, you know? And I go, can, they sold my car from the airport. Can you believe it? And he just goes, yeah, that'll happen. I was like, all right, fuck. <laughs> OK. I was like, are we going to pull the camera, videotape? And he goes, we, we don't have any cameras. <laughs> Yeah, that face, that face, that face, mom. They don't have any cameras at the at DIA. No, no, please, this is a live show. They have no cameras. Post 9-11, no camera. I know like some dudes that used to sell like low level drugs that had at least two. You know what I'm saying? You got one in the driveway at least. You're going to get robbed, but you know. I, I'm sitting there and I'm just like, y'all don't have any camera. Okay, so I was like, and that's when you realize how smooth the process of getting your car stolen is, because we're all 
narcissists. If something happens, you're like, this is the biggest deal in the world. You realize cars get stolen so much in Denver. It's just everybody just calm. Everybody's just so calm. It's like jazz music playing in the other room. Like, no one cares. I just go, so what are we going to do? Are we going to get some guys on it? He's like, we're not. There are no guys. <laughs> He's like, you wait 10 days. Geico sent you money. This happened on a Saturday. I was going to get my money in two Saturdays. <laughs> Shout out to Geico. They were really good. <laughs> they were. The Friday before I'm supposed to get my money on Saturday, I get a phone call. Young black girl, she's like, hey, sergeant's on the phone for you. It's like 4.30 on the Friday. I'm like, all right. He comes, he goes, I never do this because we never find the cars, but we found your car. And before we go any further, you have to understand this is my car. We all gonna have a lot of cars in our lives. This is my car. This is my baby girl. It's my all black Dodge Challenger, black rims. This is my girl. She's pretty, she's pretty. <laughs> and he goes, We found your car. And I go, Well, is it in bad shape? And he goes, It's untouched. And I was like, How'd that happen? He goes, Well, we caught him drag racing on I 70. <laughs> and there was a small part of me that was like, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? My car ain't going out like no rolling restroom downtown, all right? We going out on our shield player. <laughs> so you just, and, the, and, and again, I hope that you guys are able to follow along. When I know you're like, well, mention the police. There's no police. That's long, that's for TV. I, there's, they're not real. <laughs> there are no police. There were none. <laughs> there are no police. So I go, so what's next? And he goes, go to the, the I got my car stolen lot, and you go get it. And anybody that's got their car stolen, you, the, the, the I got my car stolen lot is like 10 miles past the airport, so it's way out there. And when you get there, that's what I'm talking about, you realize how many people get their car stolen. Because I got there, and there's so many stolen cars in this lot, they pick you up in another car <laughs> to go get your car. So I'm in, my, in this random lot car with this random woman driving to get my car. She pulls up on it, and she goes, there's your car. And I'm like, that's not my, that's not my car. And she goes, check the VIN number. We double checked it. That's your car. And she was right. It was my car. I don't know. I'm like, how you didn't know it was your car? I'll tell you why. Because whoever took my car must have been a car dude because they took it and they hooked my car up. <laughs> my car looked so dope, Mom. Because I had, I had the all-black Challenger. They took like one of those red racing stripes and put it from the front over the top to the back. They cut my dual exhaust 45 degrees so it handled like Fast and the Furious. And at first I was like, this is really cool. But then I thought about it for, like two more minutes. I was like, this is also rather insulting. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because God forbid somebody broke in your crib tonight while you at this event, you got home, and they just left a note like, yeah, we were going to steal your TV, but instead we just painted an accent wall here. It's, uh, <laughs> we left a rug for you to tie the room together. Do better. <laughs> and this is what I'm talking about, realizing I, like, I really had changed during COVID. Because you know, I think pre-COVID, there would have been a lot of anger and like, man, we need to get this dude. And like, they send you the papers, a young kid, he's like 25, stole my car. And so like, I didn't want anything bad for him because I realized like in that moment when I got my car, I was like, you know, it was the human experience. We're all terrible and beautiful and thieves and victims at the same time. And it really came full circle because uh, I got in my car and my car didn't smell, but it didn't smell like me. You know, like we all know how our, our house smells, you know, like, when you hug your friend, you're like, oh, that's what your apartment smells like. You know? <laughs> it's not a bad thing where we all have a smell. And it didn't smell. And I was like trying to figure out what's going on. And I immediately get in. My car's untouched, by the way. You don't even do a walk around like you at Avis or nothing. You just get these get keys. And in my car, on the passenger seat, there was a 12-pack of beer, unopened. There was a gigantic knife yeah. on the floor. My co-host, no. Yep. And I'm looking. I'm, I'm not even mad. I'm just trying to do my CSI. I'm like, why didn't he? shove that knife underneath the passenger seat. I'm trying to help him out retroactively. <laughs> and I realized he was definitely distracted because as my gaze turned, I saw what the smell was coming from, and there were two huge meth pipes in the cup holder, just chilling. And like, look, honestly, black dude from Cleveland, I don't really know what meth looked like, but I got the stomach flu and I knocked out Breaking Bad in the weekend, and these were... <laughs> These were, if there was a museum, these were pristine. These would have been in the gift shop. 
And so I stuck my head out to the woman. I was like, hey, y'all need to get in here and clean. Y'all ain't having me leaving here jammed up. And she looked, and she did a little math. She was like, uh, let's check the trunk. I was like, let's do that. This woman pops my trunk, and this is what I'm talking about with all of us being all things at once. This woman popped my trunk to my recovered stolen car. <laughs> and I was looking at probably $4,800 worth of stolen tools. And she goes, tools. And she goes, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I'm going to get the boys to clean it out for you. And I was like, my tools. <laughs> It just came out of me. I don't even do work that requires tools. I do this and do what? And she goes, those are your tools. And I was like, my tools. <laughs> and I don't even feel like it's bad, because this is what I've always told my kids. I'm like, look, when life gives you lemons, yeah. you make Facebook Marketplace. <laughs> and you sell that back in the parking lot of PNC. All right, well, are we having a good time, guys? Uh, well, I just, you know, I, I cannot tell you what an honor it is to be here. How are we doing? Are we about ready to get the person of the hour out here? OK, I wasn't talking to you, Sam. I know that you're. All right, well, we're going to keep going. I, uh, I, I, I do like the travel and like life has come back you know, full circle. Uh, I, I feel like I'm the only comic that still likes going to the airport. I do feel like the airport is magic straight up. It's the, you get a weird kind of street cred when you're at the airport. Like, if you think about it, like, the airport is the only place on the planet where you could be sitting on the floor eating a salad. <laughs> and somebody will come up to you and ask you to watch their most personal things. <laughs> That would not happen if it was right here on the street, but at the airport, somebody's like, can you watch my bags and my kid? He'll be good. <laughs> Bag traveling, things are almost back to normal, but not quite. I think that's the best way to describe like post-COVID life. Things are almost like they used to be, but it's not quite like, hotels are back, but they're not, not quite. You know, like they're clean, but they're not. <laughs> Now hotels are clean the way like a man cleans. <laughs> you know, just like things are straightened. We'll like straighten the remote out, but like we're not, don't lift anything. <laughs> Last hotel I stayed at, and I'll leave you guys with this. I, uh, I checked in and I went upstairs and uh, they just hadn't cleaned it at all. And I, when I say at all, like the person's food was still sitting in front of the door. Like I was sharing the room with some mean king from Game of Thrones. It was just like a carcass. And I called the woman. And I was like, uh, the, the most disgusting thing I've ever seen is right in front of my door. And she goes, oh, that's from the last guest. And I was like, I gathered that. <laughs> now here's where you come in. Come get it. And now here's where you guys come in. Are y'all ready to get the woman that you came to see? Up on this stage, I need some energy, guys. Now, before I bring her up, this must be said. Uh, when I first started DBL, nope, I'm going to do this because I'm a professional. Uh, you know, I was a comic. I was a wild dude. I was on tour, like, for real. And Erica took me under her wing and, like, Sometimes she would grab me by my wing and be like, we're going home. And I'd be like, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and this human being is the reason that all of you are sitting here for sure, but absolutely the reason that I am standing here as the person I am. I love Erica in a way that I can't describe. So proud of her. I'm not killing the energy. She's so dope. Uh, I need y'all to start clapping right now, because this is my girl, and I love her. She's the real deal. You guys have seen her on DBL. You guys know her from the Comeback with Erica podcast. She's my sister. Give it up for Erica Cobb. Keep clapping for Erica. Erica, Erica, how are you feeling? Talk to me. Talk to the people. Uh, I feel like I want to cry. I know. I was like, Al, if you but, ruin this. Yeah. But you kind of already started that, so no. <laughs> I, 
I love and appreciate you so much. Um, the growth that we have had together as a team, um, it's been the most life-changing thing. And tonight has been just a culmination of all the growth, all the um, camaraderie, and it is too early to cry. Yes. <laughs> um, but I want to thank you, Al, because you told me when I first said, this is what I want to do. Um, I'm like, I, I think I want to do a live show. And you were like, yeah, of course, that's what you have to do. And then I said, but what if nobody comes? And you said, of course they're going to come. Look at the portfolio of your work and look at what you've done. And he's like, do me a favor and don't just gloss over the wins like I did. And you shared your story about the night that you performed at the Apollo and how that was such a huge moment, but you just kept it moving. And I said to you, like, I really needed to hear that because I haven't stopped to celebrate the wins. So I thank you, brother. I love you. You are such an inspiration. Thank you. And we are gonna keep this going because I could talk to this human being forever, but we're all anxious to hear this incredible person that's gonna come out as well. Uh, Obviously, she's got the bag now, but she originally had the bag because she was, and you can start clapping as I say her credits. She used to hold the briefcase on Deal or No Deal. Yes, keep clapping. All of us weird sci-fi nerds know her from Sharknado. Four of us, I'll take it, but we all know her from the Real Housewives of Atlanta. I need you right now, Denver, to start clapping for Claudia Jordan. Jordan, welcome to Cocktails with the Queens. I'm back because I need some redemption. Don't hate me because I'm beautiful. Hate me because I'm here to stay. Well, when I was young, my mother forced me to do a beauty pageant and I won. And then one thing kind of led to the next. I know. Thanks, Mom. The odds of you really making it are really slim. Come on. Let me it's not like she was the only one that had other aspirations. We all did. She just got to marry Prince. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Fox Soul. It's your girl, Claudia Jordan, here with Out Loud, right here on Fox Soul. Once again, make sure you tell your friends. There's a bunch of people that got my page. Call me a liar. One thing that I'm not is a liar. We want to elevate all of us, right? And we can't do that if we continue to make excuses. When I am friends with someone, I have your mother effing back. And that is it. Yes, Claudia! Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you for being here and welcome to Come Back with Erica Cobb, a community of folks like yourselves who are getting ready and staying ready for their next chapter. Obviously, we know and love my guest today, a little backstory that I shared earlier, but I actually reached out to her almost a year ago to the day because I heard her on another podcast and I was so moved by the way that she represented what I felt like us. And I reached out to her just to give some love and support and now you're here in Denver yes. with all of us and I thank you Claudia Jordan for thank being you. here. Thank you. Thank you. You know when you when you do um, interviews or podcasts you just do them and you don't think about the impact or who receives it. And it's really nice when people receive what you're saying and they hear what you're saying, especially coming from the world of modeling. Modeling is, it's cool, it's an entryway into the business, but you don't feel very valued for what you have to say. It's basically shut up and look good. No one asks your opinion. I don't care what you think about that outfit, you're wearing this and that's it. So to go to this field, it's, it's totally different. And then to have someone like you reach out and you said such positive things and here we are, like I want to give you your flowers too for showing love to another sister out there. Thank you. Yeah. Like knows like and <laughs> speaking of like, um, not only you have had so many, I love your portfolio because it shows that we can really diversify mm -hmm. and be whatever it is that is truly on our hearts to be. So. Like myself, you also have been in radio for a number of years. How do you feel like radio and television differ? Well, I think radio is a more hostile environment for women. Mm. 
um, it's the one field where men really run it. And uh, usually when a woman is on radio, it's just be his sidekick. Mm -hmm. Don't be too opinionated. Don't talk to him in sports. Just laugh at his jokes, even if they're corny. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you feel it. And sometimes you could be a very well-paid sidekick, and sometimes it's not a well-paid sidekick, and you're miserable. Especially if you're an opinionated woman that wants to make a difference. To just be someone's support system, it's cool, but I'd rather be side by side with someone. Right. I've been told, uh, there was one male host that said they were considering me being his, his co-host. And he said, just to be clear with you, uh, if we go with you, you're not gonna be my co-host, you're my sidekick. And I was like, my resume is longer than yours though. Right. And I've been in rooms where I've, I've gotten up and, and gone and done the work and did all the show prep. Show prep is you scour the internet, you find topics, you find what we're gonna talk about for five hours of programming while my male co-host did nothing, he just showed up. And I found out later on that he was making $30,000 more a year than I was. Yeah. And, and it was okay, like no, it was a good old boys network though. Mm -hmm. That's radio. Now television, a little more friendly towards women I, I would think. Um, women were the biggest consumers. I don't know why they would miss that mark in radio. Mm. But that's okay though because um, we got time to change yeah. that. Yeah. We do. We really do. And I appreciate because I have spoken about, and not even people say speak out. I haven't spoken out. I just spoke my truth. Mm -hmm. And the truth was, you know, while I am so appreciative of every opportunity that I've ever received, you know, when I first started my big break in radio, my co hosts were making $22 million. Wow. I was making barely enough to pay my rent. And it was like one of those things where it's like, okay, you're not only a woman, I'm a woman of color. Mm -hmm. I am new to the game in some capacities, but I'm showing up and I'm doing everything that everyone else is doing. Do I deserve to be above poverty line <laughs> when, right, right. you know, when they're living on the lakefront? And I appreciate, you know, all of those things, but I feel like when people say you spo you're speaking out, like you're an activist for just speaking your truth, um, it's a way of silencing our voices so that, because the number one thing that people don't want is for us to communicate, right. because if we communicate what's happening in the moment, then that means that what we're subjected to not making more, not demanding more, not requesting more. And so I really appreciate you being transparent about that too, because for a minute I felt like I was on an island. But 22 million dollars, girl, where are they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> where they at? It's the truth, that was very well documented, that, yeah. I'm gonna have to look that up because that, that is, that's unbelievable that you go into the same space every day and do the same work, if not more, and be brilliant. And when you are a black woman, you do have, it is a fact. First of all, a woman, period. Then throw a black woman on top of that, twice as good, half the pay, half the recognition, and if you speak up, you are just so difficult. Yeah. You know, I, I reposted a meme the other day. It said, I wish brilliant women could be as confident as a mediocre man. I mean, I don't, I mean, we've just seen that in the last election, in the election before, like mediocrity. I'm sorry, I don't know if there's any Trumpers in the audience, I'm sorry. But I'm just saying, it just seems like you can be mediocre if you're a male, you know, and, and, and you get away with a lot and people give you passes. But I was getting called into HR all the time for little small mm. things like nitpicking. Yeah. And it feels like, why is it like this? Why don't we want to hear more from women? And that also is a question we have to ask our fellow women. It's not just the men, and we have to do a better job with being supportive of other women because we are the main ones. We're the main consumers. It's not just them. We play a hand in that. Yeah. You know? I, I find it going back to when you talked about just how you came into the industry as a model, like, and how people automatically peg you as one thing, but really you wanted to be a biology major in college, yeah, and you ended up as a model in Deal and No Deal, and The Price is Right. So how did that transition happen, and did you feel like you had to present something other than what, what people were expecting? So ever since I was young, I was really fascinated with science. And I mean, I wanted microscopes, chemistry sets for Christmas, in lieu of dolls. Remember those encyclopedias? I mean, I'm 50, right? So it was 1984, my mother bought a, a cycle, encyclopedia set, right? Yeah, yes, she's 50. I am as old as hip hop, okay? <laughs> so um, I remember 
my mother, one of the best things my mom ever did was buy her children a set of encyclopedias. And it didn't get wasted. Every night, I would take a different letter from the encyclopedia and just peruse and just learn random facts about things. And it just made me really curious about the world. You know, and then I would just go out and play in the woods and we would catch snapping turtles and bring them home. And my mother would be like, get that goddamn turtle out of my tub. <laughs> and you know, we would just like take water samples and it, I was really interested in, in science. And just like, I wanted to like, you know, work in a lab and cure diseases, cure cancer and all that. But um, as luck would have it, I'm in the mall with my mother and there was some scam, you know those little model agency that you said, you can be a model, just pay us $1,500 for school. Yeah. My mom remembers that too. She <laughs> took me to that. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. So it ended up going to, uh, they brought me to the office and it was the Miss Teen Rhode Island pageant. And so I entered and there were not many women, girls of color that were winning back then, back in 1990, back in the 1900s. <laughs> so I, I did it and I won and it just kind of like, I said, let me just, just see. I, I, I will say this, if you can take anything away from my parents today, is don't go with what you think your life is supposed to be. Throw, say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. Well, not everything, like not like crack and stuff like that, but like, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, it is whack. Right, it crack is, is whack. whack. Yeah. Experiences, like if you think, no, I know I want to be a model. Well, what if I would have stayed in that lane, 5'7", yeah. not 105 pounds, I would have, my career would have started and ended probably in the 90s. But being open to, okay, it's in the field, it's not quite modeling, but maybe doing commercials. Okay, maybe I'll try this podcast. Maybe I'll say yes to doing this radio show, even though I used to be really shy. And then who knows, you might unlock something that you never thought you were supposed to do, and then that's the thing that gets you like, you know, to all your goals mm -hmm. and changes your entire life. So I just say, say yes to everything except crack, like I said, and, <laughs> <laughs> and married men. And, you know, just really go for it because you, you, will, you might spark something inside yeah. of you. Yeah. Yeah, um, so we have some lessons here. Just say no to crack. <laughs> say no to crack. Yeah. Yeah. Say yes to everything else. Um, and I, I really resonate a lot with that story because um, you know my mother, who surprised me yesterday by coming in last yes. night. <laughs> Dr. Mama Cobb, front row over here. Ooh. Of course she is. Um, but she would always say that like, oh, you were you know, trying, you would do everything. And she's like, I was never like that, so it was very foreign to me. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think about it now, and I sometimes feel like when things are elevating as they are now, I get so a little bit more recluse. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious for you, like I always think about like, where is that girl that was like so bold to be like, I can do this and nobody can tell me that I can't do it. Like, you know, do you ever feel like the more that things elevate for you, the more that you're kind of like second guessing a little bit? No, and maybe because I'm dumb. I don't know. No. Exactly. No. I'm, I'm, I'm really fearless. I'm really fearless to a fault where I left Rhode Island with $500 and I didn't know anybody. Where I would never, like now thinking of going to another city across the country, who would do that now? But you know, I, I'm still kind of like that in a way where I'm like, you know what, I, I think I can do anything in a way. Yeah. Which is weird because then I'm still insecure about things, if I'm gonna be honest with you guys. But like I'll get an offer for a play, right? Here's another story about just kind of just going for it. Um, they said it was a cameo role, a small like a celebrity role where they just give you five lines, fly you out, they put your face on a flyer to get ticket sales, but you don't really do much of the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. So I put it off. Busy, busy, I didn't really pay it much mind. Didn't take it seriously, lesson. And the day before I was gonna fly out, I said, let me take a look at this script. It was not five lines, it was 43 pages. <laughs> it was 43 pages in the middle of me taping a syndicated talk show. My grandmother passed that week and I was going through a breakup, all in the same week. And I have to get on a plane and Pete, they've sold, it's almost sold out. So I got to rehearsal, I didn't even retain the first line. I just had too much going on. I couldn't focus. So um, I went to the director, I said, I don't want to ruin your play. I don't want to ruin your play, so I think you should use it, your understudy and I'll give you the money back. He said, just try. So I go to my room and I open up my Instagram and I look at my messages and there was some young girl that said, I cannot believe you're in my city. I'm only coming to the play to see you. Damn it! <laughs> 
So because of that, like things like that give me the strength to be fearless or to say, I think I can do this. So I buckle down. I run the kids here. I did have half an Adderall and it did make me focus. <laughs> <laughs> you do you know. And I was able to okay. This is bad. I swear. No, it's okay. all good. Okay. It's all good. And some of us have been there. I, I, do, I do have a time. I'm a little all over the place with it. So I focus, and it just meant so much to me that someone cared enough to come support me that I can't let them down. Yeah. So that's the thing that makes me say, I got to keep trying. I got to do something else. You know? So yeah, I don't want to ever lose that. Yeah. You know, I don't want to lose that, that fearlessness, even if it's not always the smartest thing. I, I hear you, and I, I feel like for everything that makes me gravitate towards you, mm -hmm. there are things that like, like we both talk about hot topics, mm -hmm. and there are times where we don't agree on the hot topic. Yes. You probably don't know that, but I know that okay. because like, <laughs> there was a specific moment uh -oh. where I was defending Meghan Markle oh, okay. because I was in a very deep defense of Meghan Markle yes. situation. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, oh, it was said that um, one of the deal or no deal models said that she didn't feel like she was treated like a bimbo. And I was like, well, I think everyone has a diversity of, of opinions. And I believe <laughs> that, you know, if that's the way that she felt and everyone wanted to do something different, da -da 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 -da, whatever. And then like the noon show comes around, they were like, well, it was Claudia Jordan. I was like, oh, I've been <laughs> speaking against Claudia the whole day. It's okay. But I was like, but I don't agree. I'm like, that's but cool. I didn't not not agree with you because that was your experience. Mm -hmm. I didn't agree. I, uh, I thought that it was important that there would be a diversity of, of voices heard. And I'm not trying to convince you. I'm just trying to ask you why you think that y'all had two separate experiences. Well, I was there from the pilot episode and she was there for a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And I think her, her loyalty to the show and her strong feelings about the show were different. To her, I think they were uh, one rung on the ladder of where she was going. And I respect that. And I, I, I feel like when you speak out again, it's not even against. When you have a opposing view or a different experience, we are so quick to say, you're trashing her. Or, you're, you're, you're like the British press right now. And how dare you speak out against another black woman? I want to get to a point where we can disagree about, it's very nuanced, a small, like this flower. I may not like this one petal, but I like the whole flower. Yeah. Or I may not agree with one thing, but that doesn't mean I don't agree with you as a whole. And I, I, I I don't know, I just, I guess I think that I can give a little criticism or pushback without people, it being an indictment that I don't like her. Because yeah. the British press that didn't like her, they used that against her and I felt so bad. Mm. Like I don't mean, I, I've defended her up until that point. I'm, but I'm also very protective over that environment because mm. I've worked on other game shows before that I felt that way and there were issues. I know what that feels like. Mm -hmm. So when I went to NBC in Deal or No Deal, it was such a contrast on how they treated us that I, I guess I was a little more protective. And I hope that it didn't come out that I was attacking her, because I wasn't. But I understand how it looks now, because people will use anything, because right. a lot of people don't like her. A lot of people love her and hate her. She's polarizing. Yeah. And there's a lot, I do believe there's a lot of jealousy and racism rooted in that. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of try to clean it up afterwards, but it's just, once, you, once, once it's out the bag, it's just people want to just jump on it. And they want to tell you how you felt. You know, she was only there for a short amount of time. And we knew back then that she was going to, like, you know, she really was focusing on acting. She would leave and go on auditions, you know. And there were girls that were perfectly fine with being a deal and no deal model and never going anywhere else in their career. And that's fine. Yeah. It's totally fine. Um, I, just, I just didn't feel like the staff mistreated us. Mm. And it's two different things I think we're talking about. I think yeah. I was talking about the staff, and I think she was talking about how she felt internally. Yeah. Does that make sense? Is that fine? No. That Am makes I forgiven, total Erica? Sense. That takes, makes total sense. And as polarizing as Meghan Markle has become, in, in my opinion, of no fault of her own, I agree. people love to use you for a viral moment, child. I have oh. never seen, like, I mean, anything you say goes viral, and it is pretty incredible. <laughs> like, I've been canceled really so is. many times. I'm like, when is the cancellation? Can I go on vacation? Because yeah. I, still, I still have to work. Don't say that. No, I know. Don't say that. As, uh, as Tori would go, pff, pff, pff. <laughs> whatever that is, whatever that is. It's been a lot of them. Uh, yeah. Well, speaking of um, just game shows in general, I want to play a quick game with you because I want to know, would you rather? 
Y'all want to know, would she rather? I'm going to take a drink before we start this. Are you okay, drinking well, with I, me? Yes, I will. I will. Is everybody drinking? Cheers. cheers to you. Yes. It's, Everyone it's cheers to would you rather. Oh, this game could get messy. Okay, let's start easy. Would you rather <laughs> give up social media or your favorite dessert? <laughs> oh, I like food. <laughs> Uh, but I'm addicted to social media really bad. Are you? I am really bad. Like, it's interfered with relationships. Really? Mm -hmm. You're really on there like that? My screen time is so embarrassing. Really? It's like, you, they're like, your screen time is down this week. You spent 10 hours in a day. I'm like, oh, I'm down from 12 hours? It's really bad. How do you do that? People are like crazy. Girl, I work one hour a day. On, I'm spoiled. <laughs> I've, my schedule is crazy. Like we, we film the show live, so it's like one hour. So I have 23 hours. <laughs> I actually think that's good because it could be more. So, uh, but I like banana pudding. Yeah. I guess social media, but it would be tough. I thought this was the easy question, Claudia. <laughs> Food and social media. You got me. I don't. I, I really did. Can we I, come back to this one? Okay, all right. Okay, let me try an easier question. Would you rather show up to a party overdressed or underdressed? Over. Yes. I cannot still let them see me looking like a bum. Yes. Yeah, over. And um, may I just say, y'all look fantastic. It looks nice. Okay. Yes, okay. Ooh, this is like, this is socially, this fig we'll figure out who you are based on this. Would you rather be the only one drunk at a party or the only one sober? Drunk. <laughs> when you are sober around drunk people, you are so annoyed. Yes. Like you're like, shut up, all of you. Like, it's yeah. Annoying. But if you're the drunk one, if you know, I don't really have the embarrassment gene. Like, I don't really get embarrassed, so I don't care. You don't have the Sunday scaries? I'm like, whatever, it'll go away. The Sunday scaries? What's that? That's like when you wake up on Sunday and you're like, oh God, what did I do? Am I like regretting my whole life decision? Do I need to go to rehab? Like what's going on? <laughs> Just have another drink at brunch. I don't know, no, no, I don't. Because life is short. I rather, uh, I always tell, tell my friends, I rather be on my deathbed and say, Man, I can't believe I did that instead of, I wish I didn't do that, yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, I want to say, I would rather just like, I want to do everything. Yeah. And I can explain it later and, you know, whatever. Sorry. It's like, my bad. Instead of, I don't want to, my biggest fear is to have regret of things I did not try. Oh. Except crack. Except crack. <laughs> Why is that a theme in here? I don't know. I, I don't know. It's I, never been a theme on Comeback with Erica Cobb. I'm, I'm very I'm, sure of that. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, no. I hope I'm not tanking your brand right now. It's all good. <laughs> it's all good. It's like, what is that? Um, is it better to beg for forgiveness or ask for permission? Right. So, I don't know. Sometimes I'm just asking for permission. Maybe I do that too much. Ask for permission, yeah. No, yeah. if you don't, if you act like you didn't know beforehand that it was oh, bad. No. <laughs> You could be like, I, I, I didn't know. I have stuff. no poker face. <laughs> Everything is written all over my face at all times. Because, is that like because you're younger than me and you haven't done Botox yet. As soon as you get to Botox, <laughs> you will have a poker face. You'll be like, I'm angry. I'm happy. It all looks the same. So it's not the poker face. It's the Botox face. Ten years. Ten, okay. fifteen years. Uh, all right. Okay. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but I love it. Okay. It makes sense to me. One last one because it is trending. Um, and there's a very famous couple who I adore. But would you rather go 50 50 with your husband or breadwinner pays all? Um, I've been on both sides, actually. Mm. I, would, I think 50 50 with your husband. Um, I like to have some equity in, in this, the decisions. And I've seen women that let the husband have total control financially. And when things go left, you are stuck. Yeah. And I've also been the breadwinner where you can tend to be a little disrespectful if you feel like everything's on you. Mm -hmm. If you don't check your emotions and check yourself. You know, so I would do the 50-50. I think it breeds mutual respect. And then you feel like, you know, this it's our house. Yeah. You know, I have a friend that's in a really bad position right now because she has no, she had no say. She didn't think ahead of time. You know, everyone thinks it's going to be forever. We always think it's forever.
but look at the divorce rates. Yeah, you know? Yeah. No, I worked in NBA arenas for quite some time, so I'm always like, are you sure you want to put all your eggs in that yeah. basket? Right, <laughs> right. Um, but no, I think that that's a, I love having these conversations because if you're open and there's some flexibility of thought, it's like there really isn't any judgment. Sometimes it's just like, hey sis, I've seen some things and I'm just trying to give you a heads up. Yeah, right. And I feel like you do that mm -hmm. a lot yeah. and people come for you for that reason. Well, it, I don't know what it is. I feel like I'm saying sensible things. I care about my fellow human. I won't just say women. I care about people. But sometimes it's just not received and I'm wondering, do I have like that resting bitch face? <laughs> You know, <laughs> or is it okay to swear? Yeah, you, yeah is, is we it can. Too late? I'm yeah, sorry. Uh, no. I should have asked. See, I didn't um, ask for permission. Edit. I just did it. <laughs> and I, um, I, I don't know what it is sometimes. And sometimes I feel like, why are they picking on me? But then I'm also like, well, they're listening. But I would rather people just get me at some point. And I don't know when that's going to be. I'm like I said, it's it's been like this for a long time. I feel like I can say something that someone else said, and for some reason, it's just not taken the same. And I don't know what that is. Do and this is just my theory based on nothing. Um, <laughs> but I, I do feel like mis being misunderstood by the right person and being understood by the right person gives the same energy. Mm -hmm. Like some people are committed to misunderstanding you. Yeah. And so now at this, I mean, I'm 42 now, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I really, if you are committed to at least understanding that, like. I'm, I may not get it right. I may not say all the right things. I know I'm not right all the time, mm -hmm. but I am gonna share with you what I feel like you know is of a certain benefit mm -hmm. to you. And if I'm wrong, you know that it's coming from a place of love. A good place. So if, there's, if there are people out there that are committed to misunderstanding me, then now I can clock that early enough to like really retain that resource for myself or somebody else who's gonna appreciate it. But, and I see that like when I reached out to you and you said a lot of things in that podcast about, you know, you consider yourself like a good girl, you know, a, a, a decent human being. And I understood what you were saying because sometimes people are just going to be committed to misunderstanding your intentions for one way, one reason or another. True, and I also think being, when you're transparent, you give people the bullets to kind of shoot yeah. you down. Yeah. And I am guilty of that. I, when I first got on MySpace, I thought it was the greatest thing. I get to like share, I get to post things and who I'm dating and who I'm really dating, not the rumor of a guy I stood next to at a party that I don't even know his name, you know? And, and I gave like a lot of myself and I thought if I give who I really am, they'll get to know me and love me. But then it was used against me so many times. And then once I tell a person that that is my Achilles heel, that being misunderstood, when we fall out, they use that against me every single time. Like, I've been honest about, like, I've been a victim of sexual uh, abuse and assault, right? Twice, actually. And I've spoken about it. So if we're dating and I tell you about this, and you're not really for me, and we break up, what are you going to say about me when we break up? Mm -hmm. That I'm a whore. Right. And you know that hurts my heart. So then I defend myself. So the more I defend myself, the more I look guilty, because people don't look and say, maybe there's a reason she's really defending herself like that. And I just think that's so mean to use the thing that you were vulnerable about, mm -hmm. vulnerable about against you. And it seems like every time I have a falling out with a friend or someone that was using me or a man that, you know, it went left, they use that against me. And when you keep hearing the same thing over and over again, it becomes a fact in their minds. Right. Perception is everything. And I, I am the type that likes clarity. Like, let me explain myself. And I wasted so much energy with with people that are committed to misunderstanding me. Then I went on a reality show. Well, if you don't like the person that I'm having a scene with, I'm thinking this is almost like an acting job. Like, this is just a line on my resume. I'm not taking it that seriously. You don't like the person I'm going up against. Now you hate me based on that, and I didn't even like, it. and then they see you through that lens for the rest of your career. That's so not fair. No one has ever publicized me giving prom dresses to little girls. Me driving to Compton, in my, just knocking on a girl's door and say, here you go, I heard you couldn't go to prom because you never dressed. No one's ever publicized me providing sleeping bags to the homeless people or making a pot roast and going out and giving it to people. I'm not trying to get attention for it, right. but they will publicize if I'm at a party and some NBA player whispers in my ear and says, hey, I've seen you in something. They don't know what I'm saying that's being said and they'll say, oh, she's all up on this guy. I don't know what it is about human nature lately, 
but we have got to stop being so thirsty for negative stuff to say about each other because it's not always the case. And imagine how you'd feel if it was about you, you know? And I, I, I would like, and why are we like this though? And it is, us, it is, it is us. And when we talk about reality TV and some of the, the nasty things we see, I say, well, is it necessarily the producers or is it the consumer? Right. Mm. If there wasn't such an appetite for it, they wouldn't make it because they only make what makes money. Right. So it's just like a, it's a nasty kind of circle, a vicious circle. I'm really curious because obviously uh, my day job is being a host on Daily Blast Live. <laughs> Which you were on today, and yes. thank you for being with us. And you know, we do breaking and trending news. Mm -hmm. We talk about celebrity gossip at times, mm -hmm. a lot of times. Um, and I always think about it from like when we were first cast. Like I was the least known person. Like I didn't, I didn't have that L.A., New York, Atlanta, you know, life. I never understood that. Mm -hmm. So I always thought about it as myself being like, oh, I'm like this girl that like stumbled upon this opportunity and I'm just talk like in morning radio, mm -hmm. in local radio. Like I'm just talking about it like everyone else is talking about it. And I think that's kind of protected me in a way. But for you, people have known you mm -hmm. for decades. So now that you're doing celebrity gossip, how do you tow that line between like having the conversations about celebrities but also not doing to others what people are doing to you? Um, I have a friend that started a blog and it really blew up. And before he became famous himself for what, for what he was doing, I would tell him, I have to tell you how much it hurts when, if you wrote that story about me. And they don't get it a lot of times, they just think it's the bottom line for the money. I know what it feels like to be dragged mercilessly for days about something and, and going to your family reunion and not being able to put my phone down because I'm like looking at what, other, what else do they say, they say. So I try to be like, I have a dry sense of humor and poke fun, but I'm mischievous. I think my brand, I'm more mischievous than anything, not mean, unless someone's done something really awful to someone. Um, I try to just keep it fun and not really make it a personal horrible attack on someone, unless they're like a rapist or a child molest or something like that. But I know how it feels to just like everyone pile on. I try to also say, well, what about if they, what if it was like, let's try to look at it from this other angle. But like you said earlier, if someone's, you know, they are dedicated to misunderstanding you, they're just not gonna like what you say anyways. Right. But it is tough because you go to events sometimes and you might see someone that you made a joke about like 17 years ago. They're still mad, they remember. You're like, you know how many vodkas and cranberries ago that was? I don't remember that. Or that was a long time ago. Yeah. But I try to like be a little sensitive to not going too hard with that. Yeah. But you can't really like you used to because it's different times now. Yeah, it is. Back, I did a radio show with Jamie Foxx, the, uh, the Foxhole, back on satellite radio. It was the blueprint for a lot of these podcasts that are out right now. And we were vicious on that show, but not just to celebrities, to each other. Mm -hmm. But people, it was a different time then. Yeah. Remember, the 70s, the 80s, we had shows like Archie Bunker, All in the Family. Do you remember how they used to talk on that show? Yes. Do you remember the stereotypes, the racism, the sexism? That was mainstream television. People, I need people to remember how things have evolved because they will penalize you for saying things that was okay back then, that we're, we've evolved. And give people grace to evolve. Yes. Like say, okay, you were like that, you don't like that anymore. So I just try to be a little sympathetic, but still be entertaining at the same time. And sometimes it is hard. Yeah, that's a, that's a hard line to toe. And I, as you were talking about morning radio, I had a segment called To Catch a Freak on, uh, in Chicago, <laughs> uh, where we would literally like call people on Craigslist. Um, yeah. And, and it was it, real? Yeah, it was very real. Because we did skits on ours where there was a lot yeah. of radio that's paid actors. It was, you know. well, see, that was when paid actors became a thing. Because you had to. Because of landmark cases like us. Girl, what did you do? Well, you know, you call some, they were, you, got you know, Craigslist, there was like a back ad and my mother was so embarrassed. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so, you know, yeah, anyway. My point is, <laughs> I want to know I'm what you're sitting here telling on myself. Well, what happened 20 years ago? I want to know what you did. Uh, yes, but it, you're you're so right because just shock radio was like 
the thing. When I talked about how much my co-host made back in the day, that's because Howard Stern had signed a $500 million, mm -hmm. you know, and Les Moonves gave my co-host the same, you know, type of praise. Mm -hmm. So it was just a completely different time and it tells you about the climate now that it can evolve so quickly. Yeah. And so you don't wanna be on the wrong side of that history. So it's always like this balancing act. So I do appreciate you kind of sharing with us how you, your philosophy. It's hard it, and it changes really quickly. Mm -hmm. Like you, there's words you can't say that I didn't know. Like I need them to come out with like a, a newsletter or something. We all do. To let us know. Like we what, all do. We can't, you know, you can't say like even fat. Yeah. You know, people are like you, every, every, there's some woman, the word woman now, people, breastfeeding. Some people want you to say chest feeding. Oh, what? Have you heard that? That's a thing. We talked about it on one of my shows. We're getting educated today. Yeah, like, you know, and I do agree on some things we need to correct some things that we're doing in, in society. But then some things I think there's been an overcorrection where some of the stuff is like a little bit ridiculous. I want to get to the Q&A, um, but I do want to ask you what you believe has been the biggest comeback of your personal life and the biggest comeback of your professional career. Professional, okay, let's do personal first. Um, 2009, I was in a relationship. It escalated really quickly, and then it went really badly quickly. I had no reputation before then. And then all of a sudden I was like this horrible person on the blogs. That's when blogs had to really blow up. And deals started slipping through my fingers, like everything went away. And I had this mortgage payment in LA. I was, you know, I just found myself, I got depressed. And kind of like, it was when, Hollywood is just like, if you're hot, everyone wants you. And then when you lose one job, nobody wants to deal with you anymore. It's like they throw you away the very next day. Like they don't even try to pretend. It happens quickly. And I went from being that girl to like, you're not on the list. Um, sorry, that job, that deal fell through. And I just got really depressed. Uh, a couple other things happened in my life, personal stuff, that I just was just like, I didn't want to be here anymore. And I remember being in physical pain with my depression, where it hurt me. Like, I don't know if you've had, I'm sure people here have had anxiety where you feel like you can't breathe, someone's knees on your chest. I felt that 24 seven, and I felt in my heart, was hurting, it was a physical pain, and I wanted to die. I remember I used to live in the mountains and I would drive home and I, I would think, no, I went from feeling like everyone loved me to nobody loved me. And the business can be very isolating when you're hot and then you're not, because you think that's reality, it's really not. You still have your people, but you don't see it that way at the time. I remember driving home thinking, I'm just going to just drive off the side of the freeway in the mountains. Then I, my vanity took over and said, but what if I live and I'm all messed up? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just being honest, y'all. No, I, I really thought that, right? So then I thought of a, a less violent way of maybe doing it. So I went to my driveway, my garage, pulled my truck in, and I closed the garage door, and I left the engine running. And I thought, I'll just go to sleep, and I'll just, you know, carbon monoxide, poisoning, right? But I, I have cats. The lid of my cat saved my life. The cat's litter box was in the garage, and the door to my place was open. So as I'm sitting there like with tears on my face, like I don't want to be here anymore, and I'm just like struggling with this, my cat poked his face in the doorway and looked at me, and I was like, I can't kill my cats. And I opened the garage, and I just like prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed, and then things just started like happening, like a friend would show up and force me to hug her, like I'm, you're letting me help you, and we gotta let people help us, yeah. women especially yes. black women. Yes. Stop saying I'm a strong black woman. Yeah, it is not a thing to brag about because when you say it, no one wants to help you. Yeah. They think you got it, you good. It is nothing to brag about. Women in general, like we like to take on the, I did this by myself. Congratulations, but you should have had someone helping you there. Mm -hmm. And I just want us to stop doing that because I feel like when we keep saying that, I don't need anybody, I don't need a man. I need a man to take out the trash, yeah. to tell me I'm yeah. beautiful, to help me with these bills, to just be in my life, like everything. Yeah. And I just think that we do ourselves a disservice. Mm -hmm. So I just became a little more vulnerable after that with allowing friends to, to help me. So that was one where I took this class to uh, reset how I was talking to myself. Instead of saying, I never get the job, or I always get the guy that cheats, or whatever, I would stop saying negative things. I would say, I'm getting the job, or I have the job. 
And it is amazing how much my life changed in one month. I was uh, going through, about to go through foreclosure. Um, I was single. I was just like, I felt like my world was crumbling. I changed the way I spoke to myself. And when I was jogging, I would go running. I would say the affirmation when I was running. $25,000, unexpected income is going to come. Someone's going to call me. People are going to come back into my life. And it started happening. When I look back, when I said that $25,000 thing, that month, people who owe me money came out of nowhere. I'm paying you back. I was like, what? Someone paid me back in LA? And like, it ended up, I calculated it, it was $23,500. Wow. From one month of doing it, and then people started coming back in my life. Phone calls started coming. Like I didn't have to. I have not tried to audition or get a job since. Everything I have gotten since has come to me. To this day, I don't try out for anything anymore, because when you do that, like you're putting it into the universe. I want this job. I want this relationship. I want this. I want that. I want this. And I swear to you, it happens. It's the secret. Yes. And and all of a sudden, I'm like back on a talk show set. I was doing a show with VH1. Then, I'm not cool with them anymore, but Donald Trump called me. He said, hey, I want to put you on Celebrity Apprentice, All Stars, and this time it pays three times more. And it's just like, all these things just started happening and it just built, it, built momentum up. And before I knew it, my life did not look anything like it did a couple months prior. So if you can just leave here and start talking to yourself better every day. You know, when I would be like, I'm so fat, I'm so fat. I could not lose weight when I was saying that. You know, like just visualize what you want. I know it sounds like LA crystals and I'm like weird and sage. And no, stuff, but no. It, it really, really worked. So that yeah. was my personal one. And uh, professional, I guess it ties into the same thing. Mm -hmm. Getting fired from the radio in Dallas, I got fired on a Monday. And I just, before they try to call me in the office to fire me, like they have to do it in person, I said, You ain't about to catch me. So I snuck <laughs> off early. I left the studio. I knew there was a fire, so they were canceling the show that day. So I, we were like avoiding HR. <laughs> it worked. They, and if you didn't say it to my face, I'm, I'm fired. <laughs> so we just kept like, we were like trying to like navigate, like going through the stairs instead of the elevator. So anyways, they caught me on the phone and called me and they said we're going in a different direction. It was a Monday, okay? Monday. I said, that's cool because I'm on my way to LA anyways to try out for this other show. I was just trying out for a one day on this show. While I was in LA, Mike Hill from Foxhole, that was um, a Foxhole, that was married to Cynthia Bailey. He said, can you fill in for me for two days at Fox Soul? I have to go film something. I said, all right, say yes to things. Yes, I said right. yes. I went and did, filled in for two days, acted up like tonight. And before I got on the plane to leave, when I was leaving the studio, James DuBose, the head of programming said, we need you back here on Monday. I said, I live in Dallas. He said, figure it out. Oh. Three years later, I had the top show on Fox Soul. <laughs> Yeah, like just saying yes. Yeah. Am I talking a lot? No, I we're okay. we're here to hear your story. It's the red so bull. It's yeah, the red if bull. you weren't talking, that would be weird. <laughs> um, well, I, I really appreciate your transparency when you said it's LA, crystals, woo woo. As I mentioned, <laughs> I've never lived in LA and I can attest to exactly what you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, the moment, like when you reach your rock bottom, as I had as well, and mm -hmm. anyone who's wa listened to my podcast knows, um, just the mind shift, like leaving a job that I was being not only um, verbally abused, but like micro or things being thrown over my head and cracking behind the wall type of things. And I remember calling my mother and saying, I, I don't think I can do this anymore. And she's like, well, you know, she always says, well, you know what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I left that job and I've never left a job in my life. And when I left that job, I said, this time next year, which was June, I am going to be on a national talk show. And in June of the following year, DBL came on. Six years later? And yeah, and we're finishing season six. We're going into season seven. So I believe it, and I know so many of you do too. And I want to get a few questions from the audience if you guys have some before. And to walk away from any job as a, a woman and a black woman in the business, because when, getting a job in this business is literally like hitting the lottery. And to think I'm gonna hit the lottery twice in my life or three times, it's very brave to do that. So shout Thank out to you. your moms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Do you have questions? Okay, yes. Is there one on the line? Okay, we have two people right here. Your name <laughs> I'm Tori. So nice to meet you. Hi, everybody. Hi. It's been a lovely discussion. I wanted to ask you how you feel about shame. Ooh. And I just wanted to put the word shame out there and hear your response. What kind of shaming? Deep, deep shame. <laughs> probably an inner critic that isn't correct. Mm. So inappropriate shame for your self-esteem. How do you deal with that? Mm. Shaming yourself. Um, I don't know. I don't think I mastered it yet, though. Fair. Mm. I don't, because I still have my issues with, I definitely need to go to therapy. You know? And that's something that I pushed off, because I'm thinking, I know there's so many things that once I start attacking it, I'm probably gonna be in bed for like a month crying. Girl, no, well, not, you haven't gone to therapy. I know, it's crazy, right? At all? No, oh, girl. I've never done I'm therapy. I'm not trying to shame you, but, but I, I will. But I, I, know I, I yeah. know, I do know I need it because um, just there's been a lot of trauma in my life from an early yeah. age that people don't even know about. You know, I testified in one of the biggest celebrity trials. If you, you can Google it and look it up, I don't wanna even say his name. But it was a rape trial of my best friend. Mm -hmm. And I had death threats by the time I was 18. And I had to be exposed to the wicked side of media and lying on me since 18. They've been lying on me since 18, y'all. Yeah. Um, just a lot of things that I just said, OK, I got to put, like most people, right? I got to put it to the back. I can't, I don't have time to deal with it right now. I have to go to work. I have to go, do, I got to no. be there for everybody else. I hear you. and. I could be like going back to, I'm coming at it with the best of intentions <laughs> okay. for you and anyone else who I needs like to hear this. Criticism. Yeah. I do. I thought the very same thing that if I go to therapy and I open up this can of worms, I am not going to be able to move. Mm -hmm. And I was forced into therapy around season three, four, something around season three, because I had. I'm so transparent about things that I had said so many traumas out loud for the first time on national television. <laughs> and I realized that I had all of this unhealed things. I'm just like talking about very, and it wasn't casual, like it didn't affect me. It was just coming out like verbal diarrhea, like it needed to get out of my system and I couldn't stop it. And it got to a point where I had some conversations in the studio, like, I don't think I can come back to this job. I, I don't think this is for me. Really? And that's what got me in therapy. And when I tell you, like, and you have to have the right therapist. Yes. Um, yes. And there ha has to be, you know, someone who you don't have to translate yes. everything in order to get to the baseline. Mm -hmm. But when I tell you, when I actually started to speak the things out loud, there was like such a relief in my soul. Like I was carrying all of this. So I'm saying, I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying that it's something to consider because um, when you asked about shame, Tori, that is a thing that I deal with a lot. Like I'm constantly ashamed that I'm not performing or good enough or based on what this life has given me that I'm not giving enough back. And my therapist is like, girl, and that's how she talks to me. <laughs> She's like, what or who are you talking about? Mm -hmm. Like, do you not know this person that, because right, exactly. what did you do last week? What did you do this morning? What did you do to this, for this person? What you, and it's like, okay, so are these the characteristics of somebody who should be ashamed about what you're tripping on right now. Not saying that it's not important, but it puts it into context. It is weird how you see yourself as opposed to how other people see you. Yeah. And that's a wake up call. Because you think if you're you know, an overachiever or you just go, 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 you're thinking, oh, this is, this is nothing. This is nothing. Yeah, I hosted Miss Universe, so what? That's nothing. I don't have my own show. Okay, I have my own show. It didn't last that long. It, and, and people that are on the outside looking in wish they had the first thing you complain, you weren't even grateful for, right? Mm -hmm. Which is kind of crazy. Yeah. So yeah, I do need therapy. Yeah. <laughs> I got another one. I got another one. All right, we'll take one more question and we'll wrap with Claudia. Oh, there's a few questions. Oh, well, we can. T I'm like, this is my therapy. Yeah. First of all, Erica, we're 
we're so proud of you. <laughs> How do you balance being authentic with your personal branding and content, and then also just keeping some things for yourself mm. and being able to be in this industry because it's that balance where it's like, I don't want to be fake, but I don't want to share everything either. So what does that balance look like for you? See, I'm working on that I don't want to share everything part because I think I share too much. So I don't have that part <laughs> down. And uh, I do share a lot. Um, I just don't know how to not. If a conversation comes up that I can relate to and is relevant to what I've, I've been through, I can't help but to say, and I do like to disarm other people and let them feel comfortable, like, it, you're not alone. So in that way, I've, I've probably overshared. But I also, like I said, I don't have that embarrassment thing. I don't think I, if you've had traumatic things happen to you, I don't think it's your fault. I used to blame myself for things, but I don't. Like, I'm like, well, you were a horrible person. You did that to me. Right. I could say I put myself in a position but I wasn't evil. I went in there like, you know, like, I don't know, childlike enthusiasm, but I, I, I'm trying to do better at it. And I care about it more when I'm in a relationship because I care about them. I don't want to embarrass see, them. See, I yes. know, girl, I yes. know I need therapy. Yes. You see me making this drink over here? No, I, that's, that is very, I feel the same way. Like I will spill my guts out about my stuff, but I will be less transparent when it comes to the people I love and care about because, yeah, I, I really, and especially, you know, my family, like, they're very gracious to be like, yeah, you can, you can post this. No, don't post that. You know, they're, they'll, they'll say it. But especially because, you know, my husband, who I love and adore, um, a, and I had a, a starter marriage before, mm -hmm. and I learned a lot of things, and I want, to, I want to protect him. I want to protect us. So I'm not as transparent about um, those things, but honestly, it, we pretty boring too. It's, <laughs> we're, we're fun, but we're, it's not, there's not a lot of juice you know, going on there in terms of like salaciousness. The, the people that do spill too much, like myself, <laughs> and make fun of and, and don't really take the trauma that seriously, we use it for comedy. And a lot of people yeah. that are funny, right, it's because like, that's how they're dealing with their pain by making a joke about it. When you sit down and think about it, it's pretty sad. But that's a coping mechanism. Like, okay, I'll just make fun of the thing that this guy did to me or the thing that happened. Like, you make fun of it. It's like a really unprofessional, childish way of dealing with trauma, I guess. But a lot of comedians, a lot of the, your funniest people, have had so many horrible things happen yes. to them. And they are, they, then they go out to make you laugh and you feel good while they go home and cry. Yes. Why are you talking about our owl like that? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the thing is, we all have trauma, we deal with it in different ways, and that's a, first of all, you need to be said, you are a joke. Yeah. <laughs> So with that said, do we have time for a few more questions? Yeah, let me correct one thing, because it's what? been such a perfect show. You guys are so strength cranked, so proud of you guys. It's been a perfect show, except Erica. You said one thing what? that wasn't true. You said you were the least known person. Tori definitely. <laughs> that little girl that influenced you with the play. So I want to know from both of you, what would you tell your younger self yes. slash a young girl how to get into the industry or what in any industry, what they should do in order to be true to themselves? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I actually wouldn't say anything to the girl. I would say something to the parents. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, children tell you who they are. And I feel like I was just very blessed and fortunate to have a mother who listened to me. Because I have been clear from day one that I wanted to be in radio, I wanted to be in television. And had she said, that's unrealistic, or, you know, that's not something that people like us do, and it wouldn't. 
um, then that would have changed how I felt about the possibilities of those things happening. And even though it was completely foreign to my mother, um, she just, I mean, I was making appointments when I was like seven years old and she would just drive me to wherever I told her to go. <laughs> Yeah, oh yeah, John Robert Powers was oh. in Chicago. That was like the Barbizon, Jeff knows. Yeah, Miss Preteen Skokie. Um, okay. I made those appointments at 11, and my mom was like, Erica, um, Skokie is a predominantly Jewish community. <laughs> Do you think that you're going to win Miss Preteen Skokie? Maybe you should think about just for me. Uh. And I was like, no, mom, they said that I have an audition and I am going. And <laughs> if I wasn't Miss Preteen Skokie 1992, I don't know who was. <laughs> so I would talk to the parents and just say, listen to your children because they will tell you who they are. Thank you. Yeah. Um, more along the, that thing I said earlier about being fearless. Well, except if you have an audition at Steven Seagal's house, you should be fearless. Oh, oh Lord. Lord. I've spoken about it on record, fake auditions. Um, I will say, bring your mama, bring your mom to the auditions. Um, there's only one person like you, and they're hiring you for you. And earlier on, I would compare myself to other people, and I would never be happy. I learned this lesson when I was 21, right? I did a pageant and I, um, there was this girl who was a, a, a stripper. She was beautiful, she looked like Sidney Crawford. But she had such a sad story. And I took a liking to her, so I brought her to my agency in Boston. She was six feet tall, beautiful, long legs, you know. Her career took off right away, like runways in, in Paris and, and really had like a really crazy explosion. For like a couple of weeks, I was jealous. I'm gl no, I'm glad I was jealous back then, because I'm not jealous now. I was jealous of her, and admitting that I was jealous, it was one of the best things I could have done, because it would never happen again after that. I had to come to terms with where I really was on the food chain in the modeling world. I'm not six feet tall. I'm not 115 pounds. I wasn't her age. And a lot of times we think that someone getting something over there, something that we didn't get, I was never going to be a runway a model in Paris. If I'm being realistic, I was more of a commercial model. But I could find success in other areas of the entertainment business. So when I let go of that, and I'm so, I'm so glad it only lasted for like a couple of weeks because it was a really bad feeling. It consumed me. When she got an audition, I'm like, well, why didn't I get that? And now I don't have those feelings, and I can genuinely be happy for other women that I see blowing up. I'm oh, almost every day I'm on someone's page like, girl, you did that. Mm -hmm. Today I was on Roxy's page. She was trying out for the Breakfast Club, which I'm trying out for that too. And I was like, nah, you'd be great at that. Force yourself to do it if you don't feel it naturally at first. And after a while, it will, it will be, um, you know, um, a routine of yours. So that, you know, what's for you is going to be for you. And. Um, I would have started things earlier, like I, this confidence, I would have like, I, I put off like, when I get this show, then I'll be happy. Mm. When I get married, then I'll be happy. No, nah, you can start that today. Yeah. Yeah. So like not putting off deferring the happiness and just, and when people see you being happy, they want to hire you, they like happy people. Mm. So yeah. Did I answer the question? Yeah. Well, we have to wrap. Um, uh, are, and we going I know. To the, are we going to the casino together? Is that why we have you to trying to, You've been trying to get me to go to the casino since 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, girl. I'm trying to help the well, economy. I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to stick around for a second because I have some business to take care of with okay. everybody. But Claudia Jordan, everyone. <laughs> Claudia. Amazing. Amazing. Where can people find, follow, and support you? For 12 hours a day, I'm on Instagram. <laughs> Facebook a little bit, but definitely on my Instagram, my Twitter, being very opinionated, making people mad, and making people happy, so it's a balance. And uh, what about Cocktails with oh, Queens? Oh, sorry, well they just canceled Cocktails with Queens. What? Yeah, they did. Our last... Was today the last day? Well, last Monday. 
No. This past Monday. So a lot of streaming services, it's just the money nowadays. It's yeah. just, it's difficult. But I have always said, and I believe, and I am speaking this into existence, that that show belongs on network television in a mm -hmm. studio. So I don't, I, we all want to still do it. So I think we may, it may be reimagined. Yeah. Someone else. Yeah. But you can also catch me um, uh, now five days a week starting next week on, on Fox Soul the show called TGIF, and we're very opinionated on that yes. show, and it's really funny. But I, I definitely think it's very important to have women's voices out yes. there, so it is definitely something I want to get back on the air. I so. agree. Well, thank you, Claudia. Thank you. We appreciate you, and um, I have just a few items of business while everyone's here. Um, and Claudia has so kindly said that she would stay around for this. <laughs> So um, the number one question that people ask me um, in my DMs or on social media is, drop the skincare oh, routine, yeah. sis. Drop the skincare routine, sis. <laughs> so I decided to drop a skincare yeah. collaboration. So as those of you who have followed me for quite some time, um, I have an amazing esthetician, Angel Martinez of Angel Aesthetics, who would have been here today, but she's in Italy, so I have to give her a pass. Um, but there is a complete line of a facial cleanser, a spot treatment, a uh, perfection pad, and then a moisture glow in a TSA friendly kit. These are all tried and true medical grade products um, in this beautiful DOP kit that you can put all of your toiletries in and travel with because I love travel size everything. Um, and some of them are a little bigger than travel size but they are under three ounces. And we have collaborated on this kit and you can see the whole thing as y'all are walking around, you can see what's in it. And this is retailing now, y'all are the first to have the opportunity to purchase it. But again, it is medical grade. We are not kidding around. So the kit is $155. Yes, um, but it's totally um, worth it. And you are going to find things that you're going to love about these products. Um, I swear by them. It's the only thing I've been using for at least seven years. So this is the new Erica Cobb by Angel Aesthetics Summer yeah. Kit. <laughs> And as a special thank you to my guest, Claudia Jordan, I am gifting you the first one. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, thank you. And I just wanted y'all to give me 90 seconds of grace because none of this stuff would have been possible today if it weren't for so many amazing people. So I'm asking for 90 seconds of grace, okay? Um, I wanna thank you to Claudia Jordan, my guest. My DJ and opening act, Al Jackson. Yay! Drinks and bar provided by Mix and Shoot Beverage, veteran owned and operated, so thank you, Evan. Yay! I'm like, this is about to be five minutes. Uh, food trucks provided by The Pinion and Taco Witch, both women owned and operated. Yeah. Pop up by Lariat Boutique in Berkeley, which is black female owned and operated. Y'all still have time to shop and eat because we have dessert and drink because we have this open bar, so y'all take advantage. Um, I gotta give a shout out. This epic venue, Verone Market. It is available for all of your special events so book today thank you dr scott um i i do want to say um dreams really do come true and i want all of you to think about like the wildest dream you have ever had in your life and then like dream even bigger because uh, as Claudia talked about, you know, just the positive, you know, we can talk about the power of positive thinking, but there has to be action behind that. And sometimes we stutter step because we, for whatever reason, whether it's mental, whether it's resource, whether whatever it is, but we have both been very down and out. I talk about my divorce, bankruptcy, unemployment, all at the same time. 
feeling like your life doesn't even matter at all. And then I look around at all of y'all. I look around at this venue. I look around at everything. And I think like, man, when I was like really thinking that this was it for me, I never would have imagined this. And for you to accept my invitation, and I'm gonna be quite honest, I was like, I don't have the budget for Claudia. <laughs> I hope, I hope this is gonna be enough. <laughs> and well, honestly, you could have just said we could have gone to the casino and you didn't have to pay me anything. <laughs> so I would have came for free. So but I know saying. how you roll at the casino, no. girl, and it would have cost me way more. <laughs> no. Okay? Okay. So I just wanna thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for making my dream come true. And uh, make sure that you get a photo in front of the sign. I wanna make sure that I see all of your beautiful faces when the photos come out. Um, and we will be sharing those with all of you based on your email address you provided for the ticket. So thank you so much and drive safely.